So ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure uh, to welcome you along to today's webinar where we're discussing nitrate supplements, methane and remote technologies. Our first speaker this morning or this afternoon is John Nolan to help us better understand what's involved. So just to give you a big a brief background on John. John grew up on a sheep and cattle property near Roma in southern Queensland, but after obtaining a PhD in ruminant nutrition from the uni from University of New England, he entered a career in full-time research working on cattle and sheep industry funded research projects in Australia and the UK. He has also been involved in cattle research projects in China, Cambodia and Indonesia and is currently an adjunct pr professor at the University of New England. He is currently researching the potential for nitrate in supplements for, for new ruminant livestock as a way of, re of reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. So John, it's great to have you on board and it's over to you. Thanks very much Greg and good afternoon everyone. Or oh, I guess it's good morning to people from Western Australia like one of our presenters, Roger Hegarty. And uh, as for those overseas uh, two people, I don't know what to say to them but you're probably hypochondriacs or uh, you don't sleep well or something. Anyway, I welcome you all on behalf of all the uh, other presenters. We're very grateful uh, for your interest in our cattle research and uh, of course we thank you for tuning in. You should now be able to see the outline of the webinar um, and the issues we hope to cover in the next hour or so. First up, I'll be reminding you about the basics of NPN uh, that's non-protein nitrogen supplementation and then Ron Lang will uh, join you to discuss how animals behave when they're faced with uh, different feeds and different supplement choices. Then Roger Hegarty will talk about methane emissions from cattle and put the methane story into a big picture perspective and finally Joe Miller will tell you about the research we've been doing and in particular he'll talk about the huge strides we've made in the area of uh, remote monitoring of cattle in a research context and he'll, uh, I think, also indicate the really exciting possibilities that are becoming available to producers uh, with the emerging technologies. That's um, what's to come from us presenters, but uh, we really do want to hear from you, the very large audience who have been good enough to join us. Um, we'll be attempting to answer your questions as best we can, but also we want to get your feedback on some of the issues we'll be talking about and also, also about the uh, webinar as a whole. I uh, really want to uh, sincerely thank our sponsors and supporters. Uh, the Action on the Ground project that we'll be talking about and the producer demo site projects have been made possible by the Commonwealth uh, Government's Department of Primary Industries and the We've had uh, lots of additional financial and in-kind support from other generous supporters. As you can see on the slide, we thank uh, UNE as the whole university, also UNE for its Precision Agriculture Research Group, which is a separate entity from the university as a whole, Olson's Feeds, Cargill, Bionutric, Proprietary Limited, Harrington Systems Electronics and Precision Pastoral have all been very generous, uh, both with their financial support and their moral support, which is to us very important as well. And we'd really like to sincerely thank Greg and Karen Ballinger from Marabella near Charleville, where we've uh, um, had quite a lot of uh, interaction and association, and we've really enjoyed that. So thank you to all those people, and it's probably time for me to move on, because in the next few minutes, I want to talk to you about the potential for using nitrate as a nitrogen supplement for cattle and sheep and other ruminants. The way nitrate is used in the rumen is very similar to how urea is used. It can do the same job as a non-protein nitrogen or NPN supplement, but as a bonus it will also reduce methane emissions. And uh, in an era when we are hearing every day about carbon taxes and direct action and climate change and greenhouse gases, anything which might reduce methane emissions and help improve the community's image of ruminant livestock production obviously has considerable appeal to all of us. 
My segment is really about the interesting possibility coming from our research projects uh, at UNE, University of England, and the work of other scientists here and overseas. But we may be able to replace urea supplements with nitrate supplements. Using nitrate we can still provide NPN as we can by using urea and we have done in the past, but, and this is the bonus, we may also be able to reduce methane emissions from our livestock. And I expect that uh, many of you who are listening at the moment have considerable experience with urea supplements. So I'd like to ask you, Greg, if you would to put up polling, uh, polling question number one in our series sure. while I continue so that we can learn from you, our audience, about your successes and problems with an experience of using urea supplements. Okay. In the meantime, I'll talk about nitrate as a potential supplement. Sorry? If, if uh, up in front of you now you'll see the, the question that um, John wants to ask. And the responses okay. are now coming in, which is great. Still coming in. And we'll close that off in three, two, one. Close that off. And John, you should now see the results. So around uh, about 5% look at it as being very safe, 20% as safe. 43%, the majority is that it's OK. Good. OK, so it's, it's okay, back that's, to you. That's, that's really interesting because uh, it means that uh, most people have uh, got over the, the idea that uh, urea is a really risky supplement and have realised that by good management it's usually possible to uh, use it safely and successfully um, and of course we all know that it, it can be very beneficial when used at the right times. So the first thing I want to say is that there's plenty of research that shows that nitrate can be a complete replacement for urea and it can effectively do the same job as urea. The job is to provide extra non-protein nitrogen to allow microbes to grow and multiply in the rumen and if we have more microbes in the rumen, more microbes means faster digestion, particularly of roughage type feeds, then a higher feed intake and that means that the animal gets more energy and more microbial protein uh, to allow growth and production and reproduction. So that's urea, but the extra benefits of uh, nitrate are that there can also be a reduction in methane emissions in comparison with similar animals given urea. And also we have uh, obtained research results that suggest that feed conversion efficiency may also be, be improved when uh, nitrate uh, replaces urea in the diet. So I want to back up just a little here and um, go back to a diagram which many of you I guess will have seen before in fact sheets or at field days. It's the story about urea supplements. So protein in feed is normally measured as crude protein and crude protein is actually true protein and non-protein nitrogen. And it's this non-protein nitrogen that I'm really focusing on today because urea and nitrate are both non-protein nitrogen sources that complement or add to the non-protein nitrogen that comes from the feed. And in fact in dry roughage situations uh, when the uh, herbage and uh, grass is dry, uh, there isn't much non-protein nitrogen present and that's why we can get a benefit uh, by adding urea supplements or as I'll suggest in a while, nitrate supplements. On the true protein side, on the other side of the diagram, you'll see that I've indicated the true protein can either be broken down in the rumen and used for growth of microbial cells and production of their protein, or it can bypass the whole fermentation process in the rumen. Uh, so it's actually going right through all of the mass of digester here and coming out the other end as what we call bypass protein. And as many of you know, 
So there's a real case for feeding bypass protein supplements in many of the situations where we would think first of all perhaps of urea. But that's another story. I don't want to go into that today. The main part of my story today centers on the right hand side of this diagram where we are talking about non-protein nitrogen and in particular about the ammonia that is dissolved in rumen fluid because that ammonia is what most bacteria in particular in the rumen need to grow. If we don't have enough ammonia in the rumen fluid then microbial growth will slow and so will all those other things that I mentioned before, the rate of digestion and the rate of growth of the animal. So when we provide urea we're providing a non-protein nitrogen or NPN source which generates extra ammonia in the rumen fluid and that ammonia then supplies the building blocks for the microbial cells to make protein. And as most of you know, it's that microbial protein that provides most of the protein for animal growth and production. So the really important story then is that I can draw the same picture for either urea or for nitrate. Both give rise to non-protein nitrogen and ammonia and both of those then are a source uh, for microbial protein synthesis and utilization by the animal. So the really important point on this slide at the end of the day is this. It does not matter whether the NPN source that provides ammonia is urea or nitrate. So just to back up a little on that then, rumen microbes degrade urea supplements to carbon dioxide and ammonia. Rumen microbes degrade nitrate to an intermediate called nitrite and then to ammonia. So in effect both produce ammonia and both then can provide the nutrients to support microbial growth in the rumen and protein production in the rumen. And of course when that's happening we're also getting faster digestion of roughage feeds and more energy available to the animal as well. Now I did mention earlier there's an additional benefit to providing nitrate. It's normal for hydrogen to be produced in the rumen and that hydrogen has to be removed. It is converted to methane. You can see I've given you a formula here CH4 for methane. That methane is just simply belched out of the animal through the nose and mouth. So the hydrogen is got rid of that way. When we've got nitrate present on this second dot point, hydrogen, that's H2, is used by the microbes in the reaction uh, below here, which is nitrate, you see NO3 there, to nitrite, which is actually NO2, and then to ammonia. And you can see that like methane up here, ammonia has hydrogen. So this is where the hydrogen is ending up. And any hydrogen that ends up in ammonia means there's less hydrogen available for methane production. So the animal will produce less methane. So that's the basic story. Roger will cover this in more detail later, but this one critical point links in directly to what I'm talking about with the breakdown of nitrate in the rumen to ammonia because that process also soaks up hydrogen and that means there's less available for methane production. Now just finally on this slide, in passing, you'll notice that I've put a star on nitrate here in the middle. I keep losing my own pointer here, so I'm not sure what you uh, listeners are seeing. Um, the nitrite here is starred, and down the bottom I've said nitrite is the salt that causes toxicity. Many of you will probably um, have heard of the condition called nitrate toxicity. It really should be called nitrite toxicity, but it occurs when there's high levels of nitrate uh, in feed going into the rumen. That nitrite, if it builds up sufficiently in the rumen, can be transferred into the bloodstream and the animal can then suffer from the physiological effects of the nitrite, which can be uh, serious or even fatal in some extreme cases. Now, it's interesting that we've not found toxicity to be a major issue in our research with nitrate, but there is quite a lot of evidence in the literature that it occurs on some diets in some countries and we are still very actively uh, researching this area and we have certainly a lot more to learn on that topic. So just to uh, finish me off then, I'll just sub summarize
quickly what I've said. That if we are actively considering using nitrate instead of urea as an, as an NPN supplement, the first thing to say is it's an alternative source of NPN to urea. And most grazers have experience with using urea and minimising the risks of its use. But like urea, nitrate, excessive intakes do risk uh, the animal um, suffering from toxicity. And um, in the same way as with urea, the uh, risks can be minimised by careful management. And the benefits, certainly with urea, outweigh the risks. I think most people indicated that in the poll earlier. Um, nitrate then carries similar risks to urea, but it's also an excellent NPN supplement. And there is an antidote. We do have ways of uh, treating animals. Uh, probably would need veterinary intervention, but we have uh, antidotes to uh, nitrite toxicity. But of course, at the end of all that, in addition, nitrate reduces methane emissions. We know that from our own research, and uh, there are others around the world that have also shown that in their research. So at this point, I'd like, Greg, if you would, to put up poll question number two um, to see just how your attitudes might have changed in the few slides that I've put up so far. While you're doing that, Greg, I might just um, put up the final slide so people can see that as well. Okay. Okay. You have in front of you now the second question there that um, is being asked by John. Would you consider supplementing with a nitrate? And we've got most of them coming in now. And I'll close it off in three, two, one. So I'll close it off and I will share with you the results and it is a very positive yes. So 91% of people, so that's wonderful. Okay, I will now just quickly hide that and what we'll do now is that we'll just open it quickly, John, if it's okay with you, to a quick Q&A session yes. because we do have a couple of um, questions coming in. Uh, one of the questions that has come in, uh, are nitrates low in cost and what are the commercial sources? Um, nitrate is available um, as a feed grade nitrate or as nitrate fertiliser, the kind that's uh, you know, put on pastures. And um, I guess it makes sense to recommend feed grade nitrate rather than the fertiliser grade because we don't know in fertiliser grade whether there might be uh, um, heavy metals and things of that sort. However, um, a lot of people have uh, considered using the fertiliser grade which is less expensive than the feed grade. Uh, irrespective of um, which grade you use, unfortunately, nitrate currently is something like twice the price of urea uh, in terms of bangs for your buck. That is, uh, you'll pay nearly twice as much to get the same response. And as I've said on my summary slide that's sitting in front of most people, it's unlikely that the current government policy will adequately reward um, producers uh, for reducing greenhouse gas and particularly methane emissions at the current state of uh, play. So yeah. uh, that's quite a big negative. Yeah, okay. And you sort of touched on this a bit with the, uh, the next question is, what is the comparative cost between nitrate and urea supplements per unit of nitrogen, given increasing costs for, the, for producers? What I was saying a moment ago was, in fact, based on the uh, bang for your buck or the nitrogen content of both. So it's roughly, roughly twice as expensive. Yep. All right. Well, thank you very much. I am conscious of time. There are more questions, but unfortunately we're, uh, we've got to push forward. So... Uh, our next speaker this morning, or this afternoon, I beg your, beg your pardon, is uh, Ron Lang. Ron is the Emer Emeritus Professor at UNE Armidale and is the CEO of a small consulting firm, Bionutrix Proprietary Limited. Prior to leaving Armidale in '96, he was professor, professor of Nutritional Biochemistry and holds a PhD and Doctorate in Rural Science from the UNE. Ron was honoured in '91 with the 
with an AA for his research into the use of poor quality forages by ruminants and is a fellow of the Australian Society of Animal Production. So Ron, it's over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Greg. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, I, I wish to speak to you uh, in this uh, webinar uh, considering the modus operandi of supplementary feeding and whether we can uh, predict what nutrients are required by them. Because if we're going to feed nitrogen or any other supplement, it's not the only supplement that is needed throughout the season. Under grazing conditions, under grazing conditions, ruminants and cattle in particular are faced with the changing quality of the pastures owing to the season and prevailing weather conditions. This varies from lush green past protein pastures, sorry, uh, through to pastures that have dried off and may be heavily leached of minerals and crude protein, depending very much on seasonal conditions and how far we are into a particular drought. Having evolved in these changing nutritional conditions, ruminants have developed an uncanny ability to select a balanced diet from the forages that are available in the mixed pastures. However, modern grazing management that prevents the migration rules to fresh feed means that cattle are subjected to very, feeds variably deficient in nutrients and require supplementation. As pastures mature and dry off, mineral and protein concentrations fall. And they fall further because of this uncanny ability for the animal to select those parts of the plant that are highest in concentrations of the likely deficient nutrients. The deficient nutrients vary with plant maturity and also soil fertility. But in general, the limiting nutrients, when actual biomass is present when there's plenty of feed in the paddock, are uh, usually crude protein or nitrogen, phosphorus, which can be deficient year-round in Australia and which is a particular problem in our north where our soils are heavily leached, and sulfur, which is seasonally deficient depending on the protein level in the diet. There is also the variable deficiency of trace minerals, but this depends on regional deficiencies in the soil. The changing pasture conditions throughout the year makes it extremely difficult to diagnose mineral or protein deficiencies as they occur throughout the season. Managers, this creates a, a conundrum for managers in providing supplements of the right type, particularly to the breeding herd. How then to decide the supplementation strategy? It is very difficult to predict mineral and or urea requirements of cattle grazing dried off pastures because of the variability in climate and its effect on the stage of, 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 of pasture maturity. And the extent of leaching, the amount of rain, rain or even dews can affect very much the mineral composition of the bill. We've elected to use a system developed under commercial grazing conditions to capitalize on this innate ability of cattle to detect deficiencies in feed. And this has been used in the research uh, to test the use of nitrate as a non-protein nitrogen supplement for the grazing livestock. This is based on an indicator system in which major potential deficient nutrients, nitrogen, urea or nitrate, phosphorus, and sulfur are supplied in separate block licks with salt use of some molasses and other binding materials that provide a range of trace minerals. Deficiencies of create a metabolic discomfort in ruminants uh, and they evolve to survive these periods of nutrient deficiency. They have well developed abilities to test materials that removes this what we now term metabolic discomfort. 
and they're able to correct the deficiency syndromes. If they're provided with individual sources of rear or nitrate or sulfur or phosphorus or even trace, some trace monium, these will, the ones that are selected become the, sorry, the ones that are corrected, selected according to the deficiencies that the animal is experiencing. Let me give you some examples of nutritional wisdom or metabolic discomfort. Research has shown that animals self-medicate or selectively seek out materials that supply the deficient nutrients or prevent, and this is very important, the harm of toxins in their feed. Also sulfur or crude protein, crude protein being provided by non-protein nitrogen such as urea or nitrate. They defy feed by consuming clay minerals that bind toxins. Animals that are pregnant or lactating will select higher protein diets, particularly when they're infected with worms. Sheep that are infected or not infected with intestinal parasites consume higher intake of block medicated with antihelminthics, and that's recently demonstrated in trials in Armadale. Self-medication is a result of the animal suffering metabolic distress or metabolic discomfort. I can't explain what that means in the animal, but it causes them to feed, to seek out feed resources that removes this stress. It might be very much like a, an alcoholic. The best examples I can give of this, or the most spectacular example, is the macaws, the macaws of Venezuela. The macaws uh, feed on a a very toxic uh, fruits at some times in the season and immediately fly to the clay, min clay licks and the borders of rivers and cons consume bentonite clays in particular which binds the toxic compound. The clay, the clay is the, the feces prevent, pre preventing the absorption of the toxins. If the same fruits are fed to captive birds we have two feet usually pointing in the air. This is the best example and comes from Richard Attenborough's World of Birds. The most dramatic example of animals being able or being driven to try new feeds uh, is when the deficiencies of phosphorus occurs in cattle which show bone chewing or even consumption of carcasses by the deficient animals. And even with wild animals, the same situation is being found. The deficiency drives them to seek a source of phosphorus. The commercial approach that has been, approach that has been developed is free choice supplementation. Uh, Year-round availability of mineral and urea or nitrate. Essentially, the commercial uh, technology is three separate supplements, uh, high in urea, high in phosphorus, and maybe we can add some nitrate in the phosphorus block, high in sulfur, with again some nitrate maybe included in those blocks. Animals learn to balance their needs, and the disappearance of the block signals the onset of the deficiency or their self-medication. Two examples of self-medication programs, it can be three separate blocks or an aggregate block. Uh, the three separate blocks are placed out in convenient areas where animals visit, like the watering site. Uh, the indicator block can be used as a, a, maybe a, a forewarning or in more settled areas, in the more concentrated areas where we can replace blocks. The, in this case, three blocks are included. The, the main block is a uh, Urea based block, which is mostly, which is needed in most in most concentrations, and you can see how the cattle have sought out the phosphorus and the sulfur indicated blocks that are also included in those blocks. The indicator system is being 
tested in the demonstration trial for two major reasons. It is difficult to accommodate sufficient levels of nitrate in a single block from a manufacturing point of view. You've got to put a lot of calcium nitrate in there, uh, particularly to satisfy both the rumen requirements upon the, uh, the peak of the deficiencies and at the same time reduce methane significantly. However, the amounts of sulfur and phosphorus required is much lower than the total quantity of urea or nitrate. Therefore, these blocks should be capable of taking part in nitrate supplementation. This is one of the things we want to test. Whether the drive for phosphorus and sulfur will increase the total intake of nitrogen to a level where we can safely or substantially reduce methane production at the same time increasing animal productivity. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Ron. Um, just quickly, before we launch into some quick q and I'll just seek a little bit of feedback from the audience again, just to try and get some idea of, have you ever witnessed animals self-medicating themselves? Um, if you've got to, it's obviously yes or no. Um, if you could put your answer in there, that'd be wonderful. Just to give Ron some bit of feedback from his session that he's just presented there. Most of the answers are now coming in, which is good. And don't forget while we're just doing this poll that um, if you have any questions at all, you can either raise your hand or you can type your question in. So I'll close that poll off now and I will share those results. So yeah, the, the majority of people who are listening today have actually seen animals that have been self-medicating. So just moving in quickly to a quick Q&A session. Um, as I indicated, if you can put your questions in, that would be good. So one of the questions that we do have, Ron, for you is that can the indicator system of providing nutrients be applied by other than block licks? And if so, how? No, I, I think the block lick is, for a field application, is probably the only way. Although, you know, you could use uh, loose supplements uh, in combination, but practically, practically uh, the block lick is the only way. Okay, alrighty. And just another quick question is, phosphorus, phosphorus deficiency appears to have a major effect on the animal's drive to find a cure, but what about sulfur deficiency? When does that occur in grazing ruminants? Yes, it's an interesting question whether sulfur deficiency also drives animals the same way that phosphorus deficiency does. Sulfur deficiency uh, affects directly the rumen, and I think that anything that affects the digestion of feed has this major feedback uh, in terms of metabolic discomfort. Uh, we haven't recognized a, a, a drive to, of the similar to a similar extent as we have with phosphorus. But in grazing in anecdotal material, uh, I had, for instance, a student who set up an experiment uh, with sheep, forgot to make the sulfur supplement, and without me, when I did, pointed this out, without me knowing, he went and fed pure sulfur, and the animals actually ate the pure sulfur because they become sulfur deficient. That's the sort of anecdotal material that we, we have to suggest that the drive is very strong for sulfur as well. Could I come in briefly there, Greg? Yes, yeah. you may. Uh, Greg, we had a PhD student some years ago in, at UNE who did exactly that for his PhD. He looked at uh, whether animals would, when they were made sulfur deficient, would choose between two diets, one of which was sulfur deficient and one of which was adequate in sulfur. And about 70% of the intake came from the bin that had adequate sulfur. That's to say the animals definitely showed a preference when they were sulfur deficient for a diet which was higher in sulfur. Some people said, well, they were pretty stupid animals because they should have taken 100% from the, uh, the uh, high sulfur diet. But of course, animals will always reserve the right to continue to test out the potential feeds in the environment. And so it doesn't make sense for them to go totally to one particular diet because they don't know whether another one has been changing while they're 
continuing to consume that one. So they do continue to search the environment as well. Okay. All right, thank you for that. I'm very conscious of time, so we will keep moving on. Um, our next presenter this morning is Roger Hegarty. Uh, Roger is originally from Queen, Queensland and follows on from Ron and John as being the current Professor of Animal Nutrition at UNE. Roger spent 20 years with the New South Wales DPI as a ruminant nutritionist, largely in fat and muscle development in prime lambs and genetics cross environment interactions, but morphed to understanding and mitigating methane back in the 1990s. He has continued these studies since joining UNE and today is going to leave the politics out of the greenhouse gases and give us an overview of methane from the animals and farms perspective. So Roger, it's over to you. Thanks very much, Greg, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I've sometimes spend an hour and a half on the phone to my mother-in-law, so I know we get a bit daisy after being on the phone for a while, but uh, I'll try to make it interesting because I know methane isn't everybody's favourite topic. Now this afternoon I, I want to take you on a short trip to understand some basics of livestock methane, starting with an animal's view of emissions and uh, before pondering whether, well, whether these emissions really matter to you and to me and to humanity, and then finish off with how we might realistically be able to manage them. Now, Going for a page down there that didn't go. Try an arrow. Greg, help me. Yes. I'd like to go down. Yeah. No, you're right. Just click on your presentation and then yep. use your arrow. Beautiful. Ah. There you go. Thanks. So let me start by saying that if you're a cow, then methane production is a really good thing for you. And let me explain why. Every cow works much the same as an internal combustion engine. We put, uh, we put fuel in one end, it goes into the motor that transforms that fuel from liquid into mechanical energy that can push pistons, it can turn wheels, spin tires, and it moves the vehicle along. And as part of that conversion from fuel to, to power, if you like, we also get exhaust gas generated. And you and I both know, perhaps since you're mischievous children, that the easiest way to stop a vehicle is simply to block the exhaust. If you put your hand over the exhaust pipe of a car when it just starts up, the gas can't get out, it builds up in the block, and the motor, she stops. Well, cattle are really no different from that. Um, we put fuel in the front end in terms of grass and feed, although I've seen pictures up north lately and there's not a lot of either. Um, it goes into the rumen or the paunch and it gets transformed in there into chemicals that are going to provide usable energy that animals can grow with and move with. But like a car, we also get an exhaust from that conversion of fuel to, to usable energy. And in the case of cattle, that exhaust is, is really a hydrogen gas. Now, the way cattle get rid of the exhaust hydrogen in the gut is that the micro, other microbes in the gut convert it one step further, as we see on the right-hand side of the picture here, through to methane gas, which I've abbreviated there to its chemical name of CH4. And really the only difference is that instead of the methane coming out the back end like it does in a, like exhaust does in a Toyota, the methane from sheep and cattle comes out the front end in the breath and in the belches that come out. But the key thing here that I'd like you to take away is that production of methane is nature's way of getting rid of that hydrogen. So if you let a white-coated reckless scientist to come in and uh, with some magic ingredient that's going to poison all those methane producing organisms, it's no different than the little kid putting his hand over the exhaust pipe. Hydrogen exhaust will build up in the rumen. The food you won't be able to be fermented so well, therefore it doesn't leave the rumen, the animal can't eat. And you know if you don't eat, the outcome is generally bad in the long term. So while we're reluctant to, um, to see anything, to see methane produced, we understand that at this point in time, it's still pivotal to keeping the whole digestive system working. I've got to confess, I look at methane and it seems like an inefficiency to me, as I'll explain in a minute. But methane production is fundamental to keeping the livestock running, and so we live with it, a little, that little inefficiency. It's a bit like, for instance, if you had the choice of being dropped in the middle of nowhere with a, an old Toyota that could only rattle along at 40 kilometres an hour, or getting dropped there with a Ferrari, which unfortunately the motor had seized on, 
you'd be pretty happy to take the Toyota, I think, uh, rather than potentially go at 300 kilometres an hour, but in fact go nowhere at all. And let me um, let me just say though that we're always looking to make better motor cars, more efficient, and our job is really to say, well, can we help you guys make a better cow, a more efficient cow? Uh, particularly, we'd like to re reduce that loss of energy as methane that's coming out of cattle at the moment. And let me explain why we'd want to do that with, with some simple sums, which only using rounded values, there's no decimals in here, but we know from the National Inventory that Australia has around 26 million cattle. And that same inventory would tell us that each one produces a little over 200 grams of methane a day. When you do the sums on that, it adds up to about uh, 2 million tonnes of methane a year, which is a little bit below 10% of national total greenhouse gas emissions. So it's not insignificant. So 2 million tonnes coming out of Australian cattle um, every year. Now, given that methane's got three times the energy content of grass, that's effectively, every year we put 6 million tonnes of grass straight out into the atmosphere as methane. Think, oh yeah, well, that, that may be so, but in fact grasses, you only get 50% of the energy out of grass anyway. So um, in effect we're wasting something like 10, maybe up to 12 million tonnes of grass every year getting eaten for no, absolutely no gain to the animal. It goes straight up in the air. And of course since Queensland and, and the Territory have about half the cattle. That's, uh, you guys can take about half the credit for that methane emission. Now I look at, around at the moment and I would love to have 10 or 12 million tonnes of spare feed right now. So just my self-interest and yours provides us a significant motivation to want to do something to our cattle that gets them to change the way they work inside, to put more of that feed energy into useful products and less into methane. So selfishness you know, is never far from home. Um, and there's a real financial motivation to try and capture that energy as something more useful. But there's also bigger reasons for wanting to do something with methane. Um, we, we, our generation and our kids will be, run, will be running the world and, and producing beef for the next 50 years. We live in an amazing era. You see, livestock methane fits slap bang in the middle of the three mighty forces that are coming together. I'm tempted to say like a pack of sharks but, um, to shape the coming decades of our world. And I'll be brief. I'm not a highly paid American futurist. Um, I've been specific about the future. But it seems that these three forces that are in play, population, climate and energy, are really clearly going to have an effect on all of us. So let me just step through them relatively simply, if you don't mind. In terms of population, we know by 2050 that the world's population will have gone up by a little over 2 billion people, from 7 billion to a bit over 9 billion. And as I sit here as a beef producer, I think, how exciting is that for a cattleman? 2 billion extra people in the world wanting to eat. And better than that, the gurus tell us that demand for livestock products is going to go up by 70% in that same time period. The snag, of course, is that Africa is not what you would call a rich end community, uh, and nor is Asia. But still, potential market there is a real attraction. So the world will be needing beef production. I have yet to see chickens turn northern feed base into consumable human proteins, um, or human food proteins. So the prospects for cattle in low quality fleet is tremendous. The second global force that, that is really must you and I towards having to manage methane uh, is the issue of climate change or climate variability. I have to admit that for any individual, wherever your, your station might be, the forces are just as likely to be policy and legislative forces around climate, so much as physical climate change itself. Um, that are likely to change the way the business. You know, but the numbers in the, in the recent FAO report just a few weeks ago saying that um, livestock were contributing something like 14.5% of human re human induced greenhouse gases, it's a big figure. It's not a pretty number and it's not going to avoid attention for too long. 
What's that num num number going to look like as we try and produce that 70% more animal product that we need by 2050? And you can see that you and I have to be really working to keep the, the greenhouse footprint of our animal products as low as we can in order, in order to keep our space in the food production system. And lastly, if I think the three big forces that are affecting your and my world and our kids' world in the next 50 years is the energy one. Now, Ron Lang, who spoke before me, has done a, a lot of thinking and reading and writing on the role of energy in future animal production. So I'd, I'd certainly refer any questions on that to him. But even those of us who are simple don't have to be Einstein to realise that as fossil fuel demand supply fight it out, it's only activities that are going to have a high return on fossil fuel use that'll be able to keep on buying those things. Livestock production typically has about the lowest return on fossil fuel use of, of a whole suite of energies. And my anticipated response to this is that, that we will see a return to, to solar-powered beef, as I'd call it, um, that is beef that's run off grass, and a swing away from coal-fired beef or grain-based systems that have relied on fertiliser use and other high-energy inputs. So I think it's not just my self-interest in wanting to get those 12 million tonnes of grass back and put it into beef production that says we need to reduce emissions in, in clever ways. But it's these three big giants of population and climate and energy that say to stay in the food production game, um, we've really got to, uh, to look at managing our emissions. And let me just close with two very simple slides, if you don't mind. It is really hard to reduce animals' emissions in the paddock. You put me next to a cat and say, Rog, I want its emissions down by 20% tomorrow. How can you do it? Well, we can do it two ways. We can starve the sucker or we can put them on a high-grain diet. And, uh, and neither of those is, is, is particularly desirable, certainly for the breeding herd. As John has said, nitrate is promising to, to have out there in the, in the production environment in place of urea. We've still got a lot of work to do that, and I wouldn't encourage anybody to go out swapping urea for nitrate uh, until that we've explored that and, and got the safety aspect fully nailed down. But um, let me just say that the, the hand... The, the job of managing emissions is largely in, um, in your hands and not just in the science's hands. And I want to just take that second point there by saying that anything that you can do that will improve production per animal um, oh, sorry, I can live with that, and reduce, will reduce the emissions cost of, of every kilo of beef you turn off. And I just want to close with, with this um, slide from some modelling work we did with um, uh, Delphine Bentley at NAPCO a number of years ago, where we got the 1980s cattle data from Alexandria and we got the 2005 data when they changed from the old shorthorn into a, a stabilised composite breed that had been there for a number of years at that stage. And we see that just by changing the cattle breed, they were able to reduce their emissions per tonne of uh, cattle that they weaned off the place by a little over 30%, largely because of the high reproductive rate that they were able to achieve. So I guess if I was going to wrap up a simple picture of methane for you, I'd say that from a cow's perspective, it's normal and very advantageous. But we've got to see the opportunity for diverting all that tons of feed we're wasting in methane into something that could be more productive for the animal. And I say that not just because we're trying to get every dollar we can out of the production system, but because those forces of population and climate and energy uh, I think going to encourage us in the same directions. But let's not leave it in the scientist's hands. Believe that the simple on-farm management can do tremendous things to reduce the methane cost of every kilo of beef that you turn off. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Roger. Uh, again, just to get some interaction from the audience in rela relation to Roger's talk. Before we move into a Q&A, there's another quick poll for you to fill out. If you could um, choose your answer to what method would you consider managing methane in your enterprise? Uh, and you can choose the most appropriate response there. And again, while we're doing that, if you have any questions and you wish to uh, raise your hand or type a question in, you can most certainly do so. And I will close the poll off in three, two, one.
and we'll share those results. And so there you go. There you can see um, a lot of people would use both to improve production or and methane reducing supplements. So yeah, that's an interesting response. Okay, so we do have uh, one person with their hand up and we do have a question here. So I will unmute. Steve, are you there? Steve, you there? Can you hear me? No, he can't hear me, so we'll just mute Steve and we'll go on to another one of the questions that have come in. So, uh, Roger, globally Australia is a very small greenhouse gas emitter and even less of this if we just consider animals. Is it really worth us doing something when no other country seems to be interested? Yeah, uh, good question and, and a very realist question. Um, we're aware Australia produces less than 2% of all the greenhouse gases that, that are attributed to mankind uh, and agriculture is sort of uh, less than 20% of that. Um, so yeah, there's no denying that it's small. Um, it's a small contribution that Australian livestock make, but it's a big contribution in Australia's um, uh, overall emissions profile. And you know, you don't do things because you're scared, but it does leave us quite exposed. Um, it also obviously there's a pot potential for market closure. You don't do anything, or market um, being disadvantaged in some markets. But there's also the opportunity for, for using action to our advantage in, in current markets. And we see that with a, a number of people that are looking to, to generate, if you like, greenhouse friendly, um, beef greenhouse friendly product of a number of agricultural enterprises. So I think for the moment it's, it's not just doing it for the good of humanity. Um, it's trying to capture more of that energy for your own benefit uh, in terms of how productive your animals can be. And it is trying to, in all probability, create um, a bit more substance in the vision of Australia as a clean green producer. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, conscious of time yet again, so we will move on to our very last speaker for today. Our next speaker is uh, Joe Miller. Joe is currently a project officer for UNE and is responsible for the management of the Action on the Ground project, which includes the producer demonstration site of which this webinar is based on. Joe was born and raised on his family property in northwestern New South Wales and has experience working on stations across New South Wales and Queensland. He completed a Bachelor of Rural Science with honours in adaptation of ruminants to nitrate containing feeds. After completing his degree, he went on to work with, for the CSIRO uh, and as a, as a technical officer where he worked on a suite of projects. Joe took up his current position at UNE at the commencement of the Action on the Ground project in 2012. So Joe, it's over to you. Thanks very much for that, Greg, and um, what a tough few acts to follow, but I'll, um, I'll do my best. Um, again, thanks to everyone that has joined us today for the webinar. It's greatly appreciated um, the support um, and, and interest in, in this work. Um, so to, to give you a basic overview of what I will discuss in the next section, basically be running through um, you through how the previous three presentations and concepts fit together with remote technologies to make it very innovative in our minds, a new producer demonstration trial that is largely northern focused but obviously um, is applicable to all extensive um, race and grazing systems. So first I'll describe what is the AATG producer demonstration trial. Its aims, its activities to date and into the future, the trial design, and more or less focus on how we're using the remote technology to do this um, and what the future holds. So first we've got a poll question um, that um, Greg can bring up for um, when he's ready. Yep. There you go. There's the next question for you to answer. Are you interested in using remote technologies? Um, if you can just select which one of those responses best suits you, that would be terrific. So they're coming in now, Joe. Getting them all finished off now. And I will close it off in three, two, one. And I'll close
close it off and there are the results now. So yeah, we have a lot of people that are, um, well, a few people that are already using it and a lot that are interested. Okay, I will hide that and it's back to you. Thanks Greg um, and thanks for your um, interaction. So moving on, what is Action on the Ground Producer Demonstration Trial? It is basically a station-based um, large-scale um, objectively testing um, the effect of urea nitrate and free uh, mineral supplement systems on productivity and emissions of those animals. It's a project that's funded majority by the Federal Department of Ag, Fisheries and Forestry under the Action on the Ground round of funding. What are we really trying to do? We're trying to quantify individual performance resulting from these supplement programs. So we're talking weight gain or weight change, uh, we're talking um, conception, rebreed, we're talking methane emissions and trying to take it back to individual animal level as often as we can. Similarly, and John's mentioned, uh, John mentioned in his earlier presentation that nitrate, while a novel non-protein nitrogen source, can also be used in place of urea with the added benefit of methane reduction. We've performed numerous trials prior to this one and have found that nitrate in terms of safety is similar to urea and production likewise with potential um, for improvements in efficiency. So we want to see how it, how it goes um, in comparison in um, extensive rangeland systems. The second aspect is um, remote monitoring and management of livestock in the rangeland environments. So to date, both within the industry and in research, um, but collecting objective figures on performance and behaviours of animals in these systems um, is generally difficult, particularly when you're trying to get down to an individual animal scale. Some of these aspects we're recording data on include watering supplement, um, watering and supplement behaviours, grazing behaviour, um, and pretty much any attribute that we can me measure on the animal that will relate to performance of that animal overall. But I'll come back to that a little bit later. So the trial is split into a number of stages, with the first stage um, being completed at Arabella on the Ballinger Station near Charleville, um, and involved up to 600 head, but the season hasn't been with um, too many of us um, this year, so we had to reduce that number back to, um, to allow, um, allow the country to be, be stopped. The first part of this stage is now complete, and there will be some work done there prior to the second stage. Uh, with the second stage being a larger scale yet again, and we'll start early next year on Saxby Downs, one of AJM pastoral um, stations up in the Southern Gulf. This second stage will consist of up to a thousand breeders and will run for minimum next two years, but we're aiming to go longer term than that so we can continue to build the trial. So the aims um, and activities of the PDS, what are we trying to achieve? Numerous studies prior to the commencement of the trial, as I said, have demonstrated safe replacement of urea with nitrate. That's reasonably firm, but we do have to manage intake in a similar way that we do manage urea, and similarly with every other supplement that we feed. Secondly, there has been today plenty of anecdotal evidence of free choice and self-medication concepts in grazing ruminants. But there is very limited research data and objective quantitative data on that. Um, on how those concepts affect the performance of livestock in these systems. So again, we've heard Ron give us some examples of that um, and how animals use instinct and positive and negative stimuli resulting from browsing different feeds and supplements to be able to identify a particular source that gives a greater level of positive stimulus or feeling of well-being and thus identify what they need to eat. So, what do we really want to do regarding that though in the trial? We want to quantify can the animal self-medicate to the point of increased performance above typical formulated multi-nutrient supplements when given a few supplements provided to them uh, where they can access and browse at free will. Thirdly, most of us want to be able to objectively quantify what each animal in their herd is doing, whether it be performance, how much supplement they're eating, how much of the paddock are they using and so on. Using remote technologies uh, that I'll run through in a moment, um, we're trying to pull out some of these relationships between animal behaviour and performance, as well as supplement uh, use um, and grazing behaviours. So just to 
identify what an animal does in the paddock to perform better than a contemporary in the same paddock, given the same environment and same opportunity. And possibly can we manage for this in the future, given the technologies are, are on a rising scale in terms of, um, of availability, um, you know, with lower cost barriers becoming um, less and less. So we believe that as an industry, we're all trying to become more efficient and precise in what we do to respond to you know, our changing terms of trade and to improve production and our bottom lines. So remote technology, um, some may say that it's a flasher than a rat with a gold tooth, and it is. So firstly, we're using remote cameras as a simple management tool to increase how often we can check everything in the trial. Now these cameras are commercially available ones that um, anyone could grab and, and run on their station, um, for example, for water monitoring to you know, reduce ball runs, etc. These remote cameras work on satellite telemetry, the ones that we're using, and happen to be those produced by William and Holly Harrington at UC Harrington System Electronics. These have worked terrifically, as do all of the other um, telemetry systems on the market, might I add. So in the two top right and left images that you can see on the slide, um, you can actually see the cameras that we're using that are actually plugged into the telemetry. And then the rest of the images on that slide um, are actually images captured by those um, cameras. So they're images that I have been able to um, access and you know check on water. So you can see the bottom left, there's a water leak there. We caught that within, um, within the hour, basically. Um, you can see in the bottom middle a um, few of our marsupial friends that um, are actively using, utilising station infrastructure. And then in the top middle and left middle images, you can see catalysts and supplement management systems that we've designed and built for the trial. So uh, we can actually catch things and keep an eye on things more often, um, more readily um, and more efficiently. Um, so it also, you know, those benefits rely, re relay back to station management as well. So it's a good demonstration of that. So what other remote tech equipment are we using to run the trial? So as I said, we're running a number of different supplements and we're allocating animals within one paddock for different supplements. So to do this, when animals come to water, we're drafting them using a remote four-way auto drafter to their alloc supplement. Every time they do this, they get weighed. We know when they've come and when they leave to go back to grazing or to camp under a tree or whatever they choose to do. And this is all completely passive by choice of the animal, how often they want to use it, when, um, and they, they use it all very well. So basically, the animals come in and they get drafted via this four-way auto drafter onto their supplement. These four-way auto drafters, to our knowledge, are the first in the world of their kind. So they all run on satellite telemetry. They're completely remote and they're completely solar powered. So they are, are a standalone system. And these these have been wonderfully designed by Precision Pastoral for us. Um, and hopefully you'll see some of those come on the market down the track. Um, I won't lie. You know, I have to be honest and say that some of those um, some of these sort of technologies, when they're you know first of their kind, there are a few glitches. So along the way, we have had a couple of you know solar power issues and batteries and things like that. But on the whole, accuracy has been fantastic in terms of draft accuracy. Animals use um, use it just beautifully. Um, they learn to walk over way in no time, learn to draft quite quickly. And once they've learned to draft, they'll actually draft quicker than anyone would ever be able to push them through the yard and no stress and with no man involved. So no labour, um, no mustering, um, no, no, none of those larger costs that we always are battling with. Secondly, in the top middle image, once the cattle are in, into their supplement yard that they're allocated to, all of their supplements are provided on a supplement wire, which does two things. It remotely weighs the supplement as regular as we like, so we can get it every minute or we can get it every hour or every day. And it also identifies how long that animal is there and then that allows us to identify how much individual animals are eating of an individual supplement and when they are and how long they're taking to do it and when they're doing it in the day. And again, they're all solar powered and wireless and they go back to the satellite telemetry as well um, and beam it back to me so I can go through the data. And we're currently putting all that into a database that 
automatically to get that those numbers out for us. Then top right, you can see we've also added in a web a satellite telemetry solar powered weather station just to collect that other data. So this way we can now start overlaying what are their performance in terms of weight gains. Um, please ignore that. Um, what are they? How much supplement are they eating? When are they eating it? How often are they coming to water? What are they doing in the paddock? How long are they spending grazing? How long are they spending at supplement? How long are they spending at water? Um, how often do they come in the, uh, the day? Do they come in once a day, twice a day, once every second day, once every third day? And really start to nail down some of those behaviours and try and re identify those relationships, how they relay back to their overall performance and try and start to pair out what are the high performers in a paddock doing, what are the low performers, and identify can we again manage for that. And again, you can see the bottom left there, a camera station, and that station actually pulls through all of the supplement information without ever having to step foot near the, the supplement. Obviously, there's you know, regular checks still and occasional wall runs, as, as you would expect. The, the bottom middle image now, you can see I brought up a green arrow. That's actually an um, arrow pointing to a GPS collar that actually tracks where that animal is um, whenever it's turned on every part of the day. So we can tell, it to tell us to take a log where that animal is, their longitude and latitude, and then we can collect that data and say, okay, how much of the paddock was that animal using, how long were they spending in those parts of the paddock, and so on, and then relate that image, that information back to their supplement use, their watering behaviours, and their overall performance. So we've done a little bit of a pilot on that at the same time, and I'll show you some of the really great data that most of us have been anecdotally seen. So you'll see some cattle that you tend to, to stride it out, walk the paddock, utilise most of the paddock, and you'll see others that just hang on the water. So the top left there you can see an image um, which is actually a, a processed um, map of where all the log points for a particular GPS collar, and you can see there the um, NLIS tag that that one actually represents, um, so that we can relate that back to her um, weight data and intake data of supplement. And you can see she she barely used the paddock. You know, she she only used about 30% of the paddock at best, which probably when we're trying to talk efficiency isn't good enough. But you know, we need to know how did she perform. How much supplement did she take? How much did she cost us to get that performance as well? And was she costing us more money by not utilising mm. that paddock? So we've got another image there of another animal. So this is a different animal, different ear tag, and utilise the paddock much better. So you know, more even grazing distribution, less wasted feed, um, you know, access more feed more often across the paddock, less pressure on the sacrifice zone around your water points. Um, so again, you know, what was she doing um, differently and are there animals that are high performance that do this? Are there animals that are low performance? Things like this that we need to pair out as to um, you know, how we start to try and precision manage um, livestock. Um, so not just um, not just regarding supplement use but also um, just overall management. And again, a third animal, and we put a few more collars out, but just use these ones as representative. And it used the paddock a little bit better than the first one, but not quite as good as the second one. So again, was was that behaviour beneficial to her performance? So keep your eye out on, on these findings. You know, we'll continually try and get this sort of stuff out as we get it and process the data because it really, you know, could be a a really useful piece of information in terms of management, including water points, um, fencing, um, splitting paddocks up, or how you um, group or background um, your animals and so on. And then again, what, how efficient is that animal regarding supplement use and paddock use and so on. So this brings me to my next slide. So high and low performers. We've all seen a tail in a mob, um, but you know, given the same opportunities, the same environment, the same paddock, the same water, the same supplement, everything that's been given to her is the same as an animal that's also given you good performance. What exactly has she done behaviourised, nutrition-wise, um, that has led her to that? You know, did she water more often? Did she was she able to do it um, 
more efficiently for herself, which she just simply more efficient. Um, so if we just ignore genetics for a moment and just think nutrition and behaviour, what was she doing to supplement herself the best? And these are the things that we're trying to um, pair out with some of this technology, which is really quite exciting. So we might move on to the next poll question for um, want of time, if Greg can bring that one up for us. Yep, there you go. Are you interested in improving the position of your supplementation? Next question that we're asking. So if you could uh, just give us your response there, that would be great. And they're coming in. And I'll close the poll off in three, two, one. So close it off. And obviously, <laughs> it's a very definitive answer. <laughs> OK. So that, you go. That's great. And thanks for, um, thanks for your responses there. So what does the future hold for this project? So what exactly are we going to measure if we want to dot point it down? And the list is nearly infinite. Um, so individual performance in the paddock without interruption for their day-to-day -day behaviours. Um, so reproduction and production, so we're talking weight gain, um, we're talking rebreeds and conceptions more importantly. Um, individual behaviours, so supplementation behaviours, so is she you know, browsing better than someone else and therefore performing better? Her grazing behaviours, so is she better utilising that paddock? Um, watering behaviours, so is she better able to perform because she's watering at an ideal rate? Um, how, how is that all working? Is the watering points too far away? Your um, watering radius is too large and is that impacting on your performance? Um, individual supplement use and subsequent performance. So how much supplement did they take and what benefit did that give the animal? Did that animal eat a lot of supplements for not a lot of gain and vice versa? Did an animal eat not a lot of supplements for a lot of gain? And try and identify some of those efficiencies even for the individual animal. Um, individual physiological responses, so again that all just links back to those um, first stop points. Performance of different supplements, um, which really is an infinite um, infinite range. You know, we've, we've still only captured a small chunk of how we could supplement um, to date. Um, so I think we can really improve on that. And whether that's using fecal NIRS to grab some you know, feed, um, feed quality data, or just feed analysis to try and direct that, as well as you know, how are those animals browsing? Are those animals browsing and getting benefit from that and reflecting that in their performance? So, you know, as I said, performance of animals given free choice supplements, and then remote management of animals using precision equipment. You know, potential for cost savings there, um, access to other markets, um, ease of destocking. So, the current season is a really good example of that. Um, animals that are losing weight or going backwards, the last thing we want to do is increase their maintenance by having to muster to, you know, see stock the ones that we can still fit into a, you know, a feed on entry weight, um, weight grip and so on. So, and then individual methane measurements, you know, animals that are emitting less methane typically are more efficient. So can we start to identify those animals? And the list goes on and on and this is where I come to precision supplementation. So how can we improve the way we supplement? and more directly target that, that, even to the point where we can group mobs of animals in our total herd across the station to the point where we're targeting particular supplements because that's what will make their performance the greatest and so on. So I'll leave it there at the moment and I'd just like to thank everyone for joining again and your support um, and particularly obviously the, the project collaborators including you know um, the main funded DAF um, UNE and Olsons, um, Cargill um, Ruminant Nutrition, Bionutric, um, Precision Aid for assisting with the GPS um, tracking stuff, obviously Harrington Systems and Precision Pastoral for their assistance with the telemetry and uh, the drafting technologies. And then again, special thanks to Greg and Karen Ballinger at Arabella. They've really helped us sort of, you know, nail down some of these technologies as part of the development, getting ready to start the trial. Um, and their input into that was absolutely pivotal. So we'll move on okay. to um, questions.
Yep, thanks Joe. Wonderful presentation. So we'll now open the uh, the webinar session up to all the speakers and uh, if you do have any questions that related to any of the uh, topics that have been discussed this, today, this afternoon, then you're more than welcome to either raise your hand or type them in. So just quickly, because I am conscious we are well truly over time and, uh, and I do apologise, but a couple of quick questions. Are they the supplement blocks which break out into the different nutrients available on a commercial scale? Not at this stage. Um, so if you're referring to the actual supplement monitoring um, units that we've designed, at the moment they're just um, units that we've designed for our trial purposes, um, but they could become something that um, you know, cost dependent um, and scale dependent on how many they were, there were to, to you know, fit into a commercial market, they could potentially go in to the industry as a commercial product. Okay, wonderful. Uh, are the free choice supplements systems in a block or a form or are they loose mix? So at the moment they're all in block um, and as Ron suggested that um, practically in some cases it is easier to do it in a block but there is no reason why you, um, you couldn't do it in a loose mix form. Um, or you know, in any form that you can you can feed it, I guess. Um, the the one thing that other thing that other than free choice not having a lot of objective data on is that there's not a lot of um, data in terms of um, the best ways to do that. So you know, the perfect you know base, most basic example of free choice is animals browsing um, you know um, small shrubs like in mulga country, you know, browsing short mulga and stuff as well as eating grass. Um, you know, we don't know which way the best way necessarily is um, from an objective and quantitative um, perspective um, to provide that browsing um, options, I guess. But practically at the moment, um, you know, in blocks is the, the, the easiest. Okay. Okay. One last quick question. Is remote technology dependent on mobile phone coverage? Um, it absolutely is not. So particularly satellite. Drop it in anywhere, um, point the aerial in the right direction, and it'll away it'll go. Um, then there's obviously UHF and NextG. So NextG obviously relies on mobile um, coverage, um, but UHF and satellite definitely don't. Um, and that's the beauty of it, that we can put them anywhere and they work. UHF obviously relies on some other infrastructure if you're trying to go long distance regarding repeaters and so on. But some stations already have their own repeaters set up. So um, it's sort of dependent on what you're trying to do and what your current infrastructure setup is to what telemetry you would use. Yep. Okay. Excellent. Uh, and for everyone listening, one uh, you'll probably notice on your screens is uh, jo Joe's Facebook page. Uh, Joe has set up this Facebook page in relation to his um, project. Uh, Joe, I don't know whether you wish to expand on anything. No, basically, if you just want to, you know, it's just there as a, I guess, see what we're doing, see, you know, other photos of the gear and gear in use, um, as well as, you know, some updates. So, um, you know, any other extension events, um, whether it be just radio interviews or things like that, will be put up there um, for, for future reference, um, including, you know, a link to the webinar, the recording um, will also go on there. So basically, just a you know, somewhere quickly to go if you're looking to see what's going on there or, or have another look at the gear and see how it's, you know, being used. 